have the floor. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I think when I go into presentation mode, I won't be able to see you anymore. So, um, so please uh, speak up if uh, you'd like to ask questions or interrupt or something. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it was well. It's a uh, very nice to uh, to join you. Thank you for, for the introduction. Um, it was actually kind of fun putting this, uh, these these talks together because it made me think about some, you know. Uh, some of the things that I've learned recently and I tried to, you know, so some of what I'll be presenting now are really uh, sort of the first time I've, I've talked about them. Um, also, I'll say that I have some distant family from uh, close by and uh, in, in the Lake Cuomo sort of area. So um, um, anyways, um, so I, before I get started, I'd just like to thank uh, sort of a large group of collaborators. I'm going to sort of choose from a, a variety of different works, um, but um, there's a, and I'm going to tell the story kind of of what's happened over the last few years. So there's a, a little bit of a story arc. Um, and during the, the time period that I'll be discussing is really when like graph neural networks and geometric deep learning really kind of uh, uh, blossomed. So this is this uh, group of collaborators. Several of them are physicists. Many are computer scientists or applied mathematicians or, uh, or statistic, uh, statisticians. Um, and so I'm going to start off with this kind of a, a statement, uh, and it's something that's been a theme of a lot of the work uh, that I have done, um, which is that uh, insight of the data generating process that you have when you're working with data, you know, something produced that data. And if you have insight in the data generating process, that can inform types of inductive bias on an architecture that you might use in a, in a you know, deep learning setting. And, um, and as a physicist, of course, I'm often thinking of you know, I don't, when I work with data, I usually have a, a lot <laughs> in mind about what the data generating process is. And so I've tried to abstract uh, a lot of my work from specifically from particle physics and to, um, but not to sort of all sciences. I, I'm, I usually focus on, uh, you know, the physical sciences or sciences where you have, uh, you know, some kind of mechanistic model in mind about what's producing the data. Um, and and so what I, I'll just call those physical models now, even though sometimes they, they might be, you know, they can be biological systems or something else. But um, when you have a physical model, uh, you know, especially if it's a mechanistic model, it's not just a generative model for the data. It's, it's a causal model. You know a, a lot about uh, cause and effect relationships um, and, and that's that 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 mechanism is very important. And the nice thing about working with these kinds of uh, physical models is that when you have simulators, you can use them to provide a, a lot of synthetic data. So you, you can produce a, basically as much training data as you want. Um, and, um, and because they're simulators, if you wanted to, you can even go in there and intervene. Um, so if you're doing any kind of uh, research that has to do with uh, causality or causal inference or causal models, you can make these interventions in the simulator. And you also, these are the types of interventions you uh, might not be able to do in other settings because there could be, for instance, ethical concerns if you're talking about, you know, health or, or uh, you know, something with the, you know, political science or something like that. Um, and uh, and so then and then also having this kind of known ground truth causal structure allows you to uh, test all sorts of different things, which I think are, you know, tied to a lot of the leading, you know, uh, themes and and deep learning uh, and and artificial intelligence research right now. And so I think that these kind, you know, studies of physical systems like this are pretty useful. So I'm mainly going to talk about two, uh, you know, sort of example settings in, in, in these uh, in this lecture. Um, and uh, but before I get to them, I'm just going to like pick and choose a few influential quotes that I found from uh, machine learning researchers. Um, so Stefan Malat is very well known for his work, for instance, with wavelets and a lot of more kind of classical signal processing. And so, he, you know, he's talking about learning physics with deep neural networks in this talk. And uh, and he's trying to make this connection between, um, you know, what is it that physicists have done to be so successful and how do you see that uh, being mirrored when you look at machine learning research? And, and two of the pillars that he identifies are uh, symmetries in the data and separating phenomena that are happening at different scales. So. That's what you know his talk was mainly about, and he tied that to what's going on, for instance, in deep convolutional neural networks. Um, Peter Battaglia, who, who I'm sure uh, you you must know from uh, the you know graph learning research, um, he his background is from cognitive science, 
and he worked, for instance, with Josh Tenenbaum before, and uh, and he's attended some workshops that we've organized, and he had this one slide that I got a, a picture of, which I like a lot, about essentially the message from human cognition about, uh, you know, tr sort of approaching artificial intelligence. And he's saying that essentially, you know, thinking about uh, individual objects and their relationships between, between each other uh, is, is very powerful. And that when you t think about intelligence, it's largely about model building. Um, and so that's about sort of assembling components uh, to, 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 you know, describe something more complicated. And then there's this quote uh, about uh, combinatorial generalization via abstraction and compositionality and the infinite use of finite means, meaning you basically have a few small building blocks, but you can rearrange them to do all sorts of things. As a particle physicist, of course, that rings quite true because we have very few fundamental particles that, you know, that create the universe around us. <clears throat> um, and so, so this, I think, is, you know, to me on the right track of, of where, where to go. Um, Yashua Bingio also showed this uh, slide, and I, I grabbed a little bit of public uh, discussion from Facebook that included Max Welling, Jan LeCun, uh, Leon Bateau, Dan Roy, and company. Um, and the point here is basically saying that, you know, if you're thinking about machine learning um, in, in, and you, you know, even in a supervised setting, um, that if you wanted to, you know, the things that people are struggling with now are having systems that are robust to domain shift. So if there's a distribution shift that it still does what you want, um, notions of transfer learning, um, and then of course, like uh, being, uh, being e efficient in terms of training data, so sample complexity. Um, and basically the claim here is that if you made some sort of model that had the that had the you know reflected the true causal structure of the data generating process that you might be you know you might do better on all of these different uh, uh, um, you know uh, considerations that are that are very important for deep learning research. Um, so this just kind of points to this kind of broader set of inductive biases. So you have this idea of uh, compositionality, you know, making big things from smaller things, uh, relationships between objects, symmetry, causality and scale separation. And so um, and a lot of these, you know, ideas are things that in my own research I've been uh, uh, trying to explore, like how to make deep learning models that uh, kind of mirror the, the physical systems. Uh, and just intuitively, it seemed like the right thing to do. Um, it kind of goes against the grain of some of the narrative around deep learning, which is to forget about any kind of uh, feature engineering and just end-to-end uh, -end optimization and with a, essentially it's okay if you have a black box in the middle. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the successes that you see uh, are, you know, tied to, you know, inductive biases that are that are useful for the type of data you're, you're dealing with. So convolutional neural networks uh, being, you know, basically enforcing sort of translational symmetry of the images was like one of the first real successes there, right? So, um, um, so this is a slide from uh, Peter again, that, and I'm, again, I'm kind of reiterating this, this mantra, mantra that uh, having insight about the data generating process is going to help inform inductive biases. And so here you see basically on the left, different kinds of physical systems, or uh, for instance, uh, and, and linguistics like natural language processing, a, a parse tree of a sentence. And on the right, uh, you know, you or, or sorry, uh, well, in mass spring systems, rigid bodies, et cetera. And on the, uh, for each of these panels on the right, you see a sort of graph neural network or some kind of uh, neural network with some structure that kind of mirrors uh, uh, what you think is going on. And so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna explore these kinds of ideas. Uh, and the last uh, sort of influential slide that I wanted to show just came from about a month ago uh, that there was in, in, at, uh, in California at, at UCLA, uh, there's the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics and they, they hold a number of workshops um, and one of the workshops they held recently was on deep learning and combinatorial optimization. So things like, uh, um, you know, the traveling salesman problem and, and these kinds of uh, these kinds of problems. And um, uh, uh, Stephanie uh, gave a, a, a talk there on this idea related to, um, you know, on that subject and was focusing on what she referred to as uh, algorithmic alignment. And so the, the idea here is that basically when you talk about algorithms, like uh, the classical algorithms you would use for uh, like a traveling salesman problem or something, um, they tend to be com you know, composed of subroutines, which again, you're starting to see the idea of uh, compositionality. 
and uh, and that you have and and while neural networks can be structured so that they're com composed of small little modules, um, and and so what she's trying to do is essentially formalize some some specific notion of inductive bias, and this uh, algorithmic alignment is essentially if you have a neural network uh, that can mimic some sort of algorithm with a few easy to learn modules, uh, then you have this alignment. And the uh, hypothesis is that uh, uh, this kind of algorithmic alignment is going to facilitate learning. Um, so that's very similar to Yashua's point, I would say. OK, so that that's my kind of preamble in terms of setting the stage for uh, some kind of contemporary thinking and deep learning. Um, <clears throat> and now I'm going to switch to the first kind of uh, concrete example that I have, uh, which is about uh, these objects that you see in particle colliders called jets. Um, maybe you've heard of fundamental particles called quarks and gluons. Uh, when you make them, they don't want to stay around alone and they will radiate more and more particles into a big spray of particles uh, that are called a jet. So this this whole thing here in this example, there's two jets uh, and they're you know one going this way and the other one coming towards us and they're made of a whole big spray of particles. Um, and so they're complicated objects. Uh, they happen in essentially every collision at the Large Hadron Collider <clears throat> and uh, and they're very, you know, we've studied them for you know, many years using relatively conventional techniques and deep learning is being used now to understand these objects uh, better. Um, and so it's a very active area of research. And so I'm just going to kind of tell you a little bit of the evolution uh, of, uh, of this type of, uh, of of these types of studies over the last few years. And, and hopefully there are some kind of interesting lessons to be learned. OK, so first let's think about the generative model from the point of view of a physicist. So these like red squiggly lines that you see are supposed to represent, you know, particles coming and interacting with each other. It's, it's, this is called a Feynman diagram. Um, I guess I'll say that this Feynman diagram is like a pictorial representation uh, where you can, if you're a graduate student in physics, you learn some rules that turn this graph into a probability distribution. So this graph is shorthand for a joint distribution over about, you know, 24 variables or so, which are the angles and energies of the particles flying out. Um, and so this you can do with a pencil and paper, um, but the next part of the process is that those particles will radiate a lot more. Um, and this part of the process, even though you kind of understand what's happening at the splitting, uh, each one of these uh, splittings, um, the whole thing you're not going to write down on a piece of paper anymore. You're going to put on some uh, on a computer and have uh, some program that's going to evolve the state uh, using uh, kind of, you know, uh, Monte Carlo type methods. Um, and then there's some more process that goes on until you finally get uh, these dark green particles that come flying out into your detector. Um, so for, for the purposes of this talk, sorry, I'm going to think about the evolution as just a, uh, evolving like a binary tree. And so this evolution uh, of this tree is, is not observed in the detector. So this is a latent variable that we don't get to see. And it's only these uh, uh, things at the very end, the leaves of this tree that we, uh, that we get to observe. And if you if you wanted uh, a little bit more detail, you could think of this as a generative model that's act, you know probabilistic generative model, and the probability for one of these trees uh, decomposes in the situation as, as just a product over what's happening at each splitting. So you have a parent particle that splits into two uh, children, um, and so you have this kind of simple factorization, um, and there's also energy and momentum at every splitting along the way. Um, so there's there's some parts that's deterministic and some parts that are probabilistic. So that's the so that's our model for how jets are generated. Um, of course, there's a, there's a you know important detail here which I'm not going to get into, which is that we don't see those little green dots, those particles directly. We see them through our detectors. Uh, so more accurately, the thing we observe are their energy deposits in our detector. But I'm not going to really focus on that for this talk. I'm going to imagine essentially we can see the leaves of, of the tree. So what physicists usually do um, is they try to uh, look at the leaves of the tree, which I'm calling X here, and they try to um, essentially uh, determine what that 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 history, that tree like history was. So they're trying to invert the generative process. Um, and, and that is you can think of as a clustering process. It's like a hierarchical clustering problem. Um, and so so that hierarchical clustering can be seen as you know, inverting the generative process. And we usually use, uh, uh, you know, kind of traditional clustering techniques uh, 
that are uh, often referred to as a hierarchical agglomer agglomerative clustering. So you sort of start with two things and you decide who to pair together and then you add another one and you kind of just keep clustering together more and more. And we use a, a physics uh, informed notion of similarity, which I wrote down here, which has to do with essentially the momentum of the part, the two particles that you're considering and the angle between them. Uh, it's motivated by some, you know, issues and and the, the, the theoretical understanding of the strong force and special relativity and stuff like that, uh, which I won't really go into. But the main point is that there's a physics informed notion of how far apart are two particles. Um, and uh, and so then you cluster the one, the two that are the closest together. Um, and so there are you know papers that have been written about these algorithms. I just pointing out that they've been cited you know thousands of times. So these are very influential papers in the field. And this is just to establish that this is really like the traditional way of, of dealing with this. Okay, now so part of the reason that this is like a, a reasonable strategy is that if you could get the right tree, like from the leaves, if if some if an oracle told you this is the right clustering history for. Uh, that actually produce this particle, because you have energy and momentum conservation, you essentially know everything about the tree. Um, and at that stage, essentially any question that you would want to ask in, in jet physics is almost trivially solved. Uh, you know, so if you if you knew uh, if an oracle gave you this tree and and you use energy momentum conservation, essentially you can answer essentially any the question for almost any downstream task. Um, so. Some of the downstream tasks that people deal with would be a, a classification problem. Essentially, what is the type of particle that is the, the progenitor of this entire uh, uh, spray of particles? Or a regression problem where you might want to uh, uh, try to estimate some property of one of these particles. Um, and so, so what, so what uh, physicists have normally done is they just run some algorithm. It gives them essentially a, a point estimate for what this tree is. So that's what I'm calling Z hat of X. And once they have that, they just treat it like it's the true ground truth tree and they calculate whatever that they would 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 do as if this were the true tree. Um, and then, uh, it, but then, you know, of course people realize it's not the true tree. So you have to take that into account. And so essentially you just, uh, you have to sort of take that into account in some downstream process. So you essentially, whatever the deficiencies are in this algorithm, you just kind of pass them uh, along to the downstream task you incorporate that uncertainty, uh, but it's not necessarily the optimal approach anymore, right? Okay, so hopefully the setting. Uh, is... I think we have a question. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I think we have a question uh, by Diego who asks: uh, So, is the behavior of the particles not modeled with like differential equations? It's just the binary trees. Oh yeah, it's a good question. So at the very beginning, um, you know, when I wrote this thing down. Um, it, it, this is all quantum mechanics and things like that. So when you're describing it uh, at this most fundamental level, it, it's like fields interacting. And, and at, at that stage, it looks like uh, differential equations and things. Um, but uh, but that's really like, you know, deep down at the kind of uh, quantum field theory level of description. But when you when you try when you want to try to calculate a, a scattering process, like two protons at the Large Hadron Collider scattering off of each other, um, the the differential equation part kind of happens in the so in this sort of scattering regime, which is incredibly small and microscopic, and then the particles come flying out, and uh, and then you convert that quantum mechanical description into really a classical probability distribution of, you know, given the input uh, incoming particles momenta, what's the probability that the outcoming particles have a certain momenta, and uh, and that calculation is what you can that's what this diagram essentially represents, and that's something you can do with a pencil and paper. And, and when you do that at that stage, you don't really see differential equations anymore. Uh, fundamentally, yes, there are differential equations, uh, but in the end, uh, surprisingly, even though this is all quantum mechanical, the way that this is described, uh, the scattering process is kind of described like with classical probabilities in the end. Um, the way you would calculate the probability distribution in, involves quantum mechanics, but once you've calculated it, then it's just kind of classical probabilities again. Okay, so that that was a very good question. Hopefully that uh, answered. So uh, so at this stage, essentially, uh, uh, you know, the 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 uh, justification for all the probability distributions involves quantum mechanics and things that look like uh, differential equations. But uh, in practice, when you're simulating this, it just looks like a, a Markov process with uh, classical probabilities. Um, okay, so 
<clears throat> All right, so then, uh, great. Um, so I was here, um, and I was just trying to make the point that there's been decades of research, essentially, uh, uh, with people trying to use essentially some kind of clustering algorithm, and then they uh, and then they essentially extract features from this tree, and then they use those uh, engineered features to solve some physics problem, and it works pretty well. But it's you know it's not uh, it's not perfect. Okay, so then you know starting around 2015, people started using deep learning, um, and here the kind of I think to me the important shift is that people are no longer trying to estimate this latent state anymore. They're just working with the observation and trying to go directly to solving whatever the problem is. So it has this more end to end feel to it. Um, and and so um, so all the random stuff that's happening in the in the latent state is being uh, kind of you're not dealing with it explicitly. It's all just kind of implicit in the uh, and and the data and you don't really care about what happened in the middle. You just care about what the data looks like. And so the first thing that people did were, uh, if you see here, these kind of axis is like the beam of the particles colliding. You get a spray of particles flying out, like I showed at the beginning. Um, and then you have this detector, which basically looks like a cylinder surrounding the interaction. And the, the detector is, is segmented into a bunch of uh, detector elements. And it's roughly like an image that's been rolled up into a, into a, uh, into a cylinder. Um, and so what people said was, okay, well, let's just use, uh, you know, convolutional neural networks and all this work that's been done on image, uh, image processing, you know, um, and, uh, you know, like computer vision and things like this. And so they would essentially force the data into an image like representation and then use convenets to try to solve these classification and regression problems. And that, uh, you know, not surprisingly uh, worked pretty well. Um, and so, um, so again, this is kind of a zoom in of that story that I was just telling you have particles and you stick it into a common net. Um, <clears throat> then, sorry, let me go back. There are some other things I'll talk about in a little bit, which are uh, hybrids where the neural network architectures try to exploit some more uh, physics knowledge uh, and their uh, inductive bias in their architectures that's that's uh, kind of closer to the physics than this uh, than this kind of common net approach. OK, so let me just show you kind of what it looks like. Here's a, for one of these binary classification problems. These are the two classes. This is sort of like the what the images look like on average. So it's taking a whole bunch of image, images and averaging them. Uh, and here they've been kind of rotated to, to uh, and, and scaled in, in, in some ways to remove some uh, symmetries in the data. So they're all kind of uh, you know centered in a certain way and rotated. And so they look very similar. Uh, if you look maybe here, it's a little bit more of a hot spot than over here. Um, and uh, but these approaches, these deep learning approaches, were working better than what the hand-designed approaches that people had done before, and so that got people excited. Um, this is what like a saliency map that I'm overlaying, where you see the red is sort of uh, uh, preferring one category versus the other, and it, and it, this aligns with the physics intuition about what why why uh, you know what part of the image has the most important uh, information in it. So that was kind of uh, satisfying for people. Uh, the problem is that these images that I'm showing are averaged over, you know, many, many uh, of these jets uh, examples. Um, if you looked at just one jet example as a point cloud, which is the kind of the more natural representation, uh, this is what it looks like. And the size of the circles here represents the energy of the particles. Um, and so, uh, you know, so there, so if you took this point cloud and you projected it into an image, the image is going to be very sparse. Most of the pixels are going to be empty. And some of the pixels will have some some energy deposited in them, and sometimes there will be more than one particle in the same pixel, and you will have lost that information, right? So the point cloud approach seems to be much nicer um, uh, from several points of view, especially if you want to scale it up. You know, the sparsity of these images is is really not nice, right? Um, another issue is if you look at the detectors in detail, this is like a, a you know with a side view of the detector, and this is the looking. Uh, Along the axis, you see it doesn't really look like pixels. You know, they're not perfect squares. They, the the detectors have sort of an elaborate geometry associated to them. So uh, so this this pixel like representation is really not what you want to be working with. You'd like to work with something more intrinsic uh, to the data. <clears throat> so so well, I'll say the the first problem that you have is that the number of particles in this point cloud is uh, is uh, is not fixed, right? There's a variable number of them. And so when you went back to kind of 2015, 
you know, physicists weren't really very sure how to deal with neural networks that had variable length inputs. And so the first thing that, you know, we were familiar with were like uh, language processing where you deal with uh, sequences of words or something like that. Um, and but that but the ordering is, is you know, words have a, a, a sequential ordering, but our particles don't have any ordering to them. So, and we didn't really know how to deal with sets. Um, so then I, I started seeing some work that was being done with natural language processing where you had this tree like structure, uh, which is a parse tree. And I thought, oh, this looks like, you know, jet physics. If I make the analogy that the words uh, are like the particles that are hitting my detector and the parsing of the sentence is kind of like the jet algorithm. So, so this was the kind of first thing I did in this direction. And I, I did that together with uh, Gilles Loup and Kangyan Cho and Cyril Beko in, in 2017, 16, 17. Um, and so what we did is we ran our algorithm, uh, this clustering algorithm, and it would give us a tree uh, so dynamically, for every every uh, set of you know point cloud that we see, we run this clustering algorithm. We get a tree, and then we use that uh, with a recurrent architecture, um, and uh, and where the the same you know hidden states would be the well the the nonlinearities would be shared and repeated across the the uh, <clears throat> the network, and that would take several particles and distill it into one uh, uh, hidden state with a, a fixed length vector, which you could then hand to a classifier or something. Um, and so this seemed kind of interesting. I'll point out, though, that when you run this uh, this clustering algorithm, uh, there's a hyperparameter uh, alpha here. And uh, and so when it's set to one, you get trees that look like this. If it's set to, oh, this should say minus one. If you set it to minus one, you get trees that look very, very different. Um, this is more like the physics. Uh, this is, you know, kind of not like the physics, but uh, in principle, you know, you have this hyperparameter you have to deal with. Um, so right, so this is just details about the about the recurrent architecture that we use. There was uh, since Kung Yun Cho was involved, we used the kind of uh, gated recurrent unit. Uh, so so sort of like an LSTM or a GRU. You know, we used a GRU type architecture in here. Uh, and then more recently, together with uh, um, um, uh, um, Sebastian Macaluso, we did we developed we kind of extended the the nonlinearity here. Uh, to include a one one you know one D convolution or a network and network architecture. Um, anyways, th these are all kind of details. This is this has uh, been some time, but what we saw is that compared to images, if you used uh, particles, it worked significantly better. This is like a a rock curve, but plotted in a kind of unusual way that particle physicists like to do, where the false positive rate you you actually plot one over the false positive rate. It's the equivalent just plotted in a different way, but up and to the right is better. So, um, and these kinds of neural networks also needed much less data to train. Um, okay, so so then to continuing on with the story, we're getting to graphs, I promise. Um, you could then ask like, uh, okay, well, you know, if that if the true physics generative model, say the tree looked more like this, but I clustered uh, using a, an algorithm that gave me a tree that looked like this, um, you know what would happen? Like, does it does it matter if if uh, because I know that like there's almost no chance that my clustering algorithm is going to get the right tree. Um, and so the thing is that if the neural network, if like the recurrent state has a lot of capacity, it doesn't really care. It has it it has all the information as input, and the neural network will do learn what it needs to do uh, to solve the problem. Um, and it will just kind of arrange itself appropriately. Um, and so this kind of inductive bias. Um, you know, you're hoping is going to help, uh, but uh, if you give it the wrong kind of inductive bias, maybe the neural network will, with enough training data, will just figure out what to do. Um, but I guess the important point is that I'm trying to stress is that if you use this kind of architecture, it may succeed, but the information that's being passed along uh, at each node is not going to map on to the physics, right? Um, and so, if you use something like this, you know the idea is that really all, the sufficient information to pass along these nodes is just like the likelihood at that splitting. So in, in some sense, it's just there's like a single number that you can pass along, and you would be able to kind of have like the essentially the optimal uh, the optimal information if you want to do a classification task. Um, so and if you want to do a regression task, you could have a bottleneck with like four four numbers, uh, and that would basically be sufficient. So. So this is kind of this alignment idea that if you have the right architecture, you would you would hope that the hidden state and what the neural network is learning might mirror the actual physics of what's going on. Uh, but if it doesn't, you know, maybe you don't care from a 
pure uh, performance point of view, but from these other kinds of issues about causality and transfer learning, you probably do care. Okay, so um, <clears throat> now some other comments about this approach. Uh, um, so it is invariant to permutations. If I took all the leaves and I permute them, um, you might think it would be uh, totally different. The thing is, I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to keep the same architecture. The architecture uh, uh, is, is, uh, is permutation equivariant. If I, if I permute the inputs and I run my algorithm again, uh, it will, it, I'll get a new tree out and the tree will look like the permutation of the original tree. So, so this, this architecture is permutation equivariant. Um, and, uh, um, and so then, and there's also this thing that, you know, maybe what I would actually like to do, for instance, is like study this hyperparameter and try to understand like what is the best way to cluster these jets. So there are questions that are not just about end-to-end uh, -end learning classification and regression tasks. There are questions I care about as a physicist that actually have to do with the, the latent state here itself, right? And so if I wanted to attack those, pro those kinds of questions, this architecture is sort of a step in the right direction. But one of the problems with it is that if I change this hyperparameter alpha or I change the momentum of the particles, this architecture is going to change discontinuously because of the way that that uh, clustering algorithm is involved. So this is that's not good uh, for deep learning to have these kind of discontinuities. So um, so we looked for something better. And so that's what led us to the idea of representing uh, jets as a graph. And so now the idea is you probably would guess is that the nodes of the graph are going to be the particles. So here's like a two dimensional representation of like literally where the particles hit the detector. And again, the size of the circle is like their energy. Um, and so we have a, a graph where the nodes are the particles. And then I need some adjacency matrix. And you could just use like a geometric distance in the detector. Uh, but for a physicist, there's, a, this, there's another notion of distance, which is like more appropriate, which is the same thing that I used for the clustering. Uh, because it, it has the right properties in terms of special relativity. It's more motivated by uh, 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 the, the strong force, uh, the theory for the strong force, um, uh, et cetera. Um, so, so the idea was, okay, well, let's use a graph neural network. Uh, and with this is the adjacent, adjacency matrix. Um, and what's nice here now is that if I change this hyperparameter alpha, the adjacency matrix will change continuously. And if I change the momentum of the particles, the adjacency matrix will also change continuously. So that was the original motivation, actually, for using a graph neural network in this setting. Um, that was around 2017. Um, and we presented this, uh, this was, I guess, kind of some of the really early work using graph neural networks and, uh, and you know, for physics problems. Um, and so, but what, here's a point that I'd like to make, which is, um, you know, it's kind of about how deep learning and science are related, is that um, what we did, you know, here was there was something kind of significant, which is easy to overlook, is that we made an, uh, a connection uh, between uh, something physical that I can interpret, which is like some notion of distance between two objects, and this deep learning architecture component, which is the adjacency matrix. And so when you, when you connect the semantics of these two different things, um, and, you know, and that could be generalized as like an attention uh, mechanism or something like that, you, there's two things that you can do. One is that as a physicist, I can import my physics knowledge into the architecture, uh, which would not be obvious how to do it all if I was dealing with like a, a just a feed forward MLP or something, right? Um, but the other thing that I can do is I can learn the adjacency matrix and, and to solve some task. But when I'm done solving that task, I can still interpret the adjacency matrix in the same way that I was using it before. For instance, I can export the adjacency matrix or this learned attention mechanism and use it to define a new clustering algorithm. And so that that ability to like pull out this component and use it in a totally different context in some algorithmic sort of setting uh, to me is really interesting. And it's the kind of notion of interpretability that's like much more interesting than like poking inside of the neural network to try to figure out why it made a certain decision. It's more that you have a component or a module that means something and you know how to use it in a different context. And so that to me is like uh, very exciting. OK, so <clears throat> so um, this is a, a slide from uh, uh, from PTAR, which maybe you've seen before, uh, sort of trying to classify different types of uh, uh, graph neural networks. Um, and so he talks about convolutional approaches, where you're essentially taking the data at the at the neighbors and accumulating it, weighted by some essentially the adjacency matrix or these like convolutional filters. But these are not learned; these are like fixed. Um, 
There's another approach where you try to learn what that uh, would be, and that's like an attention mechanism. And then there's a more general approach, which is a more of a message passing type of algorithm where you uh, essentially uh, uh, kind of compute uh, some quantities on each of the edges, and then you accumulate the, the information on the edges. Um, and uh, so th this first approach where we would import our physics knowledge and just fix the adjacency matrix, you can think of that as a convolutional approach. Um, we could also try to learn with that adjacency matrix, that would be something like attention, or we could go all the way to something like message passing. Um, so we did some early work. This was presented at a, a workshop at NeurIPS in 2017, uh, where we, uh, I guess, technically in this in this framing, it would uh, count as a message passing network, but we considered sort of each of the three different flavors in, in some sense. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through that too much, but we we did do that, and that was that was uh, cool. And uh, one of the things that we did is we did try to learn the adjacency matrix. And one of the ways that we did it, uh, when we parameterized the adjacency matrix, we said, okay, well, we'll have a piece that's the identity, which is just feeding back to each uh, node to itself. Uh, we'll have a, a physics component, which is going to be fixed. Uh, so that's like the convolutional piece. And then we'll have a learned component, uh, and then we'll put coefficients in each of these. And, and, and then let's basically see what happens. And so this is kind of interesting because it's sort of like saying, can I learn uh, some improvement over the physics algorithm, this like residual? Um, and, uh, and you saw that as you train, for instance, that the importance of the physics component, which started off to be large, you know, kind of decayed. And uh, of course, there's some degeneracy between the two and things like that. But uh, it kind of points into a direction of how you could start to learn physics uh, in, some, in some interesting way. So, OK, so that's. That was that kind of early work that we did with graph neural networks. Um, now, in the last few years, sort of 2017 to the present, there's been a ton of work, uh, and I can't I can't cover it all. Um, uh, but there have been like review articles, and there's like uh, you know small conference uh, or workshops. Uh, so we hosted one at NYU uh, uh, last year. There were about 100 people attending, um, and so. Um, and so here's a review article with some physicists and Peter Battaglia is involved. Um, and then there's this one a particular benchmark study that I'll talk about in a, in a second. Um, so let me just give it like some highlights. I'll just give sort of two highlights of, of recent work um, that I haven't already discussed. So one is that uh, the idea of deep sets. So um, if, if you know physicists were, were drawn to the point that we wanted the, the network to be uh, permutation invariant, um, and so I think, you know, somewhat independently, uh, this group at MIT started thinking, well, why don't we just add together all the hidden states? And that's essentially the, the deep sets architecture. Um, then they, they found the deep sets paper, but they were sort of thinking along the same lines at, this, uh, at that time. And, um, and so then, yeah, so the, the, here's an, uh, a, an approach that uses deep sets. They will also do things where, for instance, they restrict the features that are input to, uh, that are attached to each node. Uh, so that they can try to ensure uh, some other theoretical properties, uh, uh, you know, that, that physicists care about, so that the resulting function has some nice property. Um, so there's a, it's a little bit more than kind of vanilla deep sets, uh, but the, most of that is about considerations uh, for the input features. Um, the other thing that was done, and here uh, Michael Bronstein uh, uh, has his impact on the field, uh, uh, is that there's the kind of dynamic graph convolutional neural networks. And the idea here is you're you're going to have a um, uh, well. There, there's this sort of edge conv uh, where you 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 calculate information on the edges, and then and then you aggregate it with some sort of symmetric aggregation function, which could either just be a sum or a max or something something similar to that. Um, and so this uh, this group uh, at, uh, in in California and at CERN uh, sort of adopted this. And for reasons that I don't really understand, uh, physicists seem to like to take these uh, existing uh, network architectures and then give them a new name. Uh, so, for instance, here, uh, these the deep sets approach was 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 called either the energy flow network or the particle flow network, and here it's called uh, particle net. Okay, but it's it's basically one of the uh, these dynamic graph CNNs. Um, and so then there was a uh, a comparison that was done, a benchmark comparison. Um, and so here's this uh, paper that was written. Uh, my postdoc uh, Sebastian was had a major role in sort of bringing all this together. Um, but what was nice is that we got essentially the community together and say, like, hey, let's take all take our fancy algorithms and run on the same benchmark and see what happens. And here's a table, and what you see is, you know, in the top row are kind of image-like approaches, 
Uh, then there's a, a deep sets approach down here at the bottom. There's this dynamic graph convolutional neural network here. Um, and then there's this tree based approach that I talked about. Um, and then I'll just, there's a, several metrics in this table. I'll just focus on this one particular column. Uh, here, this is essentially one over the false positive rate. Um, and so larger is better. And what you see is that, you know, some of them don't really perform very well. And then there are a few that are like work quite a bit better. Um, and you see that, for instance, well, one, the, the dynamic graph CNN uh, 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 does the best uh, out of these. Um, the tree based approach, which is, you know, not really a graph neural network in the traditional way of talking about it, uh, also performs very well. Um, and then the image based approaches, if you use a kind of typical CNN, it doesn't work very well. Uh, this approach with, with a ResNex architecture and, you know, 1.5 million parameters does pretty well, but it's a it's a gargantuan network. Um, and, and the deep sets approaches, you notice they do have like a, a bit of a gap in terms of performance. Um, but it, over here, I'd also just like to draw your attention to the number of parameters. Um, so the, the image based approach, you know, had a lot of parameters. Um, the deep sets approach was pretty small. The tree, uh, the tree based approach, even here, it's the even with this network and ne network architecture, still only has like 30,000 parameters and uh, and performs very, very well. So um, so that's kind of that's kind of interesting. So these are. Um, yeah, so I don't know, you see some of the trends and I'll I'll come back to some of the theoretical uh, understanding about uh, not necessarily expressiveness, because, for instance, the deep sets is technically, you know, kind of universal, so it should be expressive. It's more about like in practice, you know, trainability issues and, and the capacity of an actual uh, instance of one of these architectures, like how well are they going to do? Um, <clears throat> OK, so I'm going to pause there for a second in case there are any questions that anyone wants to ask. Um, I think I think okay. we have a question from before, uh, yeah, but yeah. like 15 or 20 slides back uh, so on how to estimate uh, variable Z, like how to how to do how, how how do we know how good Z of X is? All oh, right. Yeah, it's a good question. So I mean, you uh, so that yeah, it does go way back here. Um, let's see where were we? Um, so the typical sorry, yeah, the typical approach uh, that would be used would be that you uh, you use this quantity. You would start with in, like two. You would have a bunch of leaves, like a bunch of particles, and for each pair, you know, so I and I prime are a pair. You would calculate uh, this quantity, and, and that's like a distance measure. And then you'd find the two that are the closest, and you would cluster them together. Um, and then you would just repeat that process over and over again. And so that's this agglomerative clustering. And that uh, when you do that, it, it produces a binary tree that looks like this. Um, and, and so that's what I'm calling sort of Z hat of X. There are other algorithms uh, around, but these are the dominant ones. Um, and so for, for instance, for different values of alpha, you will get different trees. Um, and so then if you want to ask, OK, well, how good is it? Well, well, you need to specify a lot more information. You need to say, like, what is the downstream task? How am I going to use this tree? You know, uh, and then what kind of metric do I want? Um, but at that point, you can just, uh, uh, you know, you can essentially just turn the crank and take a bunch of jets, uh, cluster them, and uh, and then you know look to see how they perform. If you got those jets from a simulator, you would actually know the ground truth tree. So there's all sorts of metrics that you could use, uh, but you could basically just check to see what kind of classification performance they would have or, or regression performance or something. But all of that regression and classification would be based on some features that you derive from this tree. So the tree is kind of like part of a, a bigger pipeline. And I'm not really uh, talking about the, the details so much, but uh, in, in a classification setting, uh, you 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 know there's a, a you know typical features that you would extract from this tree that you would use uh, for the classification problem, and and they work pretty well. That's what physicists use for decades, um, uh, but the deep learning approaches are doing better. So hopefully that's kind of good good enough uh, of an answer. Uh, can I ask a quick question? So. Uh... You mentioned uh, you mentioned symmetries, and well, uh, besides symmetries that come from physics, uh, there there are also possibly symmetries that come from the geometry, let's say, of the detector itself. Uh, how are these symmetries used in uh, in the architecture, and how do you combine the two? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So in um, so if I just think about like I rotate around like where is this object in the detector? There's like a azimuthal angle around the beam axis, and 
the detectors break that slightly just because you know uh, they have to have feet to hold them up on the bottom and not on the top and but for the most part those are small effects um uh, so the so if you neglect that and you think it's symmetric uh, you also have a a symmetry that has to do with the uh, the special relativity Lorentz boost along the beam axis. Um, and so this uh, this di, you know, i prime quantity, uh, the part of the reason that's motivated is it, it bakes in those symmetries. So this thing will, this object is symmetric under those kind of uh, simple rotations and Lorentz boosts and things like that. Um, and so in that sense, this uh, this adjacency matrix will, will be symmetric under that. Um, and then uh, the features that you're actually attaching to the nodes, you know, they might be sitting in a particular frame sometimes, uh, but then you, I guess you're just kind of hoping that the neural network is going to learn how to uh, calculate uh, a, a quantity that's invariant. invariant. But there have, been, uh, there have been works where people try to force the architecture so that like when you, when you want to calculate something that's a function of two nodes, that it, it also is kind of forced to have certain symmetry properties. So, so in it, this big... Yeah. Edgar Ryan's message passing, right? Uh, something like uh, E3 and N, the work of Max Welling, for example, for, for molecules. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's more that could be done just because there's so much activity. And, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a, these studies take a fair amount of work. But uh, there, is, there are papers that try to, to explore uh, a lot of these different directions kind of individually. And I think what's needed now probably is to try to uh, Go back and, for instance, take an architecture like this, and then try to in incorporate some of those equivariants, uh, those additional symmetries. Um, so yeah, the, the story is not done, but it's but the field is certainly moving in, in that direction. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so if it's okay, then I'm going to kind of start uh, uh, talking about something that's going to seem very well. I mean, related in terms of jet physics, but unrelated in terms of uh, graph neural networks, but then I'm going to tie it back in. Okay, so 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 have some patience with me for a second. So I'm going to talk about some other approaches to jet physics that we were exploring. Um, um, so one of them is if I go back to the generative model for this thing, I basically think that the probability for this entire tree looks like a, a, a product of the probability over each of the splittings at the uh, along the way. And you know the problem is I this is latent, so I don't I don't know it. Um, and but if I, you know, for a particular tree, I could calculate in principle the joint likelihood of the observed, you know, data X and the latent variable Z, uh, given whatever parameters of my my physics model that I have, and that's what I'm calling theta. Um, but but since I don't observe Z, this is not going to be particularly useful. Um, I could then think about, uh, you know, finding the best possible tree is something like a maximum likelihood approach. Where I want to like sum, like scan through all the possible trees and find the one that maximizes a likelihood, or I might be interested in like a marginal likelihood where I want to essentially mark, you know, it's here I wrote it as an integral. I guess technically it's a sum because it's discrete, but I would want to sum over all the possible uh, clustering history z, uh, and then uh, and then calculate the probability of the observed data given the the parameters. And this is really like the most physically meaningful thing. The problem is that this integral is over an enormous space, okay? The number of trees that you can attach uh, to the, these leaves grows combinatorially, um, and it, they can be just absolutely enormous uh, space of, of possible trees. So, um, but to try to study this, uh, uh, Sebastian uh, wrote a, 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 a generative model called Ginkgo. It's kind of a, simplifies the physics a little bit, but it has the essential ingredients there. It's written in you know, Python using Pyro, and we're using it to try to study different kinds of paradigms for how to approach this problem. Uh, but it captures the essential physics, and it's it's very simple to work with. Um, so when we started to think of it in these probabilistic terms, we started to realize that, okay, well, the clustering heuristic that we used before, this distance measure, um, that you know, here it is. And in and, and contrast, I can think of the jet probabilistically in terms of this, this likelihood, which is a product over likelihoods at each of the splittings. Um, and then you can make the observation that if this, the likelihood at each splitting is a one-to-one -one function with this similarity heuristic, this distance measure, um, then I can think of these clustering algorithms as a greedy, a greedy algorithm trying to find the maximum likelihood, uh, you know, the maximum likelihood or maximum a posteriori uh, tree uh, given all the possibilities, right? Um, and so that's kind of nice because then you can turn these uh, sort of clustering problems into a more probabilistic language. Um, and then this immediately suggests that I can do 
do better by, for instance, using beam search or some other kind of search algorithm. Um, so if you go through, the, you know, down this path, the, the difficulty is the number of trees grows enormously. So if you have 11 leaves, uh, there are 600 million possible trees. So the search space is very big. If you had 150 particles, you'd have 10 to the 300 leaves. So, um, so you're not going to do that, uh, ex you know, uh, through brute force. Um, and so we, we work together with a, a group, uh, uh, Andrew McCollum's group, uh, so Nick Monath and Craig Greenberg and Sebastian and I. And, uh, and so the idea was basically we developed a, a kind of, we considered only the, you know, the subclass of possible, like these binary trees where the likelihood is a product over the, the siblings um, and, uh, and, and developed a kind of a data structure that we call the trellis, uh, which allows you to kind of efficiently represent all the possible binary trees. Um, and uh, and so then you can you can uh, navigate through this trellis and uh, and you can use a dynamic programming algorithm and you can efficiently find the maximum likelihood or you can calculate the uh, the marginal you know the, the partition function the sum over all the possible uh, histories efficiently um, and efficiently here means it's exponentially more efficient than just doing it uh, you know through brute enumeration. But it's still growing, you know, exponentially itself. So it's still expensive. Uh, but we have developed a, a sparse approximate version that has controlled runtime and, and algorithmic complexity, so we don't have to scale, you know, like this. Um, but this 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 trellis algorithm is kind of cool. It's a, it's a totally non deep learning approach to it, um, and, and it involves these dynamic programming algorithms, right? Um, so I'm not going to go through this, but you know, this is sort of the the dynamic programming algorithm and how the trellis works. Um, in parallel, we we did some things where we thought, okay, well, since we know basically everything, we can ask we can also cast this as a, a Markov decision process and start to use things like reinforcement learning. So we took the same model and cast it that way and started using things like uh, Monte Carlo tree search and stuff like that. Um, and then most recently, we uh, we realized that we could use this trellis uh, architecture or sorry data structure and then run an A star search. Uh, over this uh, this data structure to efficiently find the, the like the maximum likelihood tree. So I'm not going through all of this. I, I, the slides have too much text on them. The main point is that we have this other thread of research, which is more like traditional algorithmic approaches to this problem. And so why am I telling you this? And what does this have to do with graph neural networks? So the reason I'm mentioning it is that all of this kind of these two threads of research came together <coughs> um, last month. Uh, at this uh, this IPAM workshop about deep learning and combinatorial optimization. So you can see what I was just talking about is, is definitely a combinatorial optimization problem. You're trying to go through this enormous combinatorially large number of possible trees uh, and you have a, a, a well-defined objective and you're trying to find that thing. Um, and there were several papers, uh, I mean, presentations there where people are using graph neural networks. Uh, so Pitara had pointed to these works about uh, graph, uh, like using graphs for algorithmic reasoning uh, algorithmic inductive biases. There's this re like a review paper on it, um, and then and the Steph uh, Stephanie's uh, uh, talk was basically on the same theme. And so here you start to see this kind of convergence of these two lines of thinking. Uh, so one of them is just making the point that okay, you can kind of that graph neural networks align quite well with dynamic programming algorithms, and also the point that many physical reasoning tasks you can think of as di dynamic programs. Um, and so, and so, I just gave you an example. Um, and so, um, and so, then she gave a specific example, which is a shortest, uh, shortest pathfinding algorithm, the Bellman Ford algorithm, and kind of representing that in terms of a graph neural network, and making the point that, for instance, uh, some types of graph neural network architectures will be able to handle this quite well, while, for instance, a, a, a deep sets type of architecture uh, does not really align uh, well with the uh, with this type of algorithm. And so that's why there's like a big X here, you know, uh, and essentially the issue is that if the deep sets is using a sum aggregation uh, in the actual Bellman Ford equation, you would want something like a, a min. Uh, so if you replaced the sum with a min, maybe it would work well, I don't, you know, but but it's also you kind of want to represent it as steps along the way. So in some sense, you want several layers in your graph. Um, and then uh, and then there's some, you know, uh, you know some more slides here basically talking about this and again you see max min pooling and some pooling and uh, what kind of you know it, you know distances you see and then there's a this point here that that i think is kind of interesting uh which is that 
you know, here in some sense, you're encoding some nonlinearities into the architectures themselves. And this is kind of interesting because like when we started that early work with the tree based network, um, you know, if you asked why, I mean, in some sense, it just intuitively seemed like a good thing to do. And part of the point was that if you got it right, if there was this alignment, then the uh, the neural network would have a very simple task at every stage. Um, and uh, and so and so the architecture itself is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, and so you see the same kind of ideas. Um, and here's a, a piece of evidence there, um, which is that uh, the same kind of uh, tree based architecture, instead of being used for a, a discriminative task like classification or regression, has also been used as a in a generative mode. Like, can I generate uh, jets with a neural network that look like the actual jets in the data or, or like jets that I get out of a traditional simulator? Um, and so here uh, they, they've taken one of these they force the tree like structure and then they learn the probability rule that you need to have at each of the nodes so that the final jets look like the right thing. And what's interesting is after you've trained it, it you can go and inspect the latent state of this generative model and compare it to this, the corresponding quantities in the actual physics simulator. And that's what you see. The, the blue histogram here is the distribution of some, you know, some uh, uh, latent variable uh, in the actual physics simulator. And the red is what this uh, neural network based generative model that has this algorithmic inductive or has this inductive bias uh, learned and you see that they aligned very well. Um, and so to me, this is like this is pretty cool stuff. Uh, and and that was kind of what I I think I wanted to uh, to get to mainly in this first part. Um, I do have something kind of uh, quick and different that I would show, but I'll, I'll pause here in case there is any question or discussion or anything. And again, I can't see you, so uh, please uh, someone uh, say if there's a. So, so we don't have question in the chat, but so if anybody wants to ask anything, I guess now is the time. OK, that, that's fine. Um, so I will. Um, I'm going to show a few quick slides on something sort of uh, still motivated by physics, but kind of a different thread. Um, um, and uh, and then and then I'll end. I just felt like I couldn't uh, not mention this. So this was some work that uh, that I did with uh, um, uh, uh, well this this group of uh, uh, this group of authors here. Uh, you'll probably recognize some names like uh, Hadar and uh, Yaron, who are quite well known in that graph neural network uh, type work. And this is about uh, uh, learning functions that go from sets to graphs. Um, and so the the setup here is that um, there, there are different types of uh, problem, you know, uh, formulations that you might run into. One could be that you have a, a set of, uh, of objects as input and you would like to predict uh, some function on that set of, of objects as output. So the colors here, I guess, are sort of like the, the, the targets that you're, you're aiming for. Um, there are things where you might want to go from a set of objects to the edges uh, between them, or you could make a graph which has both the node information and the, the edge information. Or there are, you know, hypergraph like objects where you have three edges where the, the quantity includes, say, like three vertices. Or, uh, uh, and so there's one hyper hyper edge associated to it. Um, and you can, of course, represent uh, the node information uh, fairly uh, simply. You know, you just have you have sort of uh, n nodes and a, and a d dimensional feature associated to each one. You can uh, represent the edges, you know, as a sort of a, a you know, you know, you know, n by n uh, tensor, and then you can do three edges this way and etc. So the question that we were sort of interested in was, you know, can we learn functions that go, sorry, from uh, from sets uh, to graphs or sets to these kind of, uh, you know, hypergraphs? Um, and uh, and so we came up with this particular uh, architecture, um, which is, very, you know, it turns out to be like quite simple. Um, which so you start off with uh, here's a set. So you have this in case there's four, you know, n is four. You have four objects, and the, the this direction is are the features associated to each of them. Uh, and then you run uh, some uh, set to set type of alg algorithm. So this could be something like uh, deep sets, for instance, which is sort of known to have these like universality properties. Um, and then the, you run uh, next. You compose with a, a, a function beta, and what it does is it's it's basically uh, uh, it's re we refer to it as a broadcasting layer. It's not a learnable function. It's just taking these objects and kind of uh, shaping them into uh, the uh, 
uh, the target uh, domain that we're interested in. So in this case, this is uh, just a graph with with uh, normal edges, not like a hypergraph. Uh, if you went to a hypergraph, there would be uh, the broadcasting layer would be you know more complicated. Um, so your own and company had done some work earlier about kind of classifying the types of uh, uh, linear equivariant maps uh, that that work in this, and there there's a sort of uh, bell number uh, that appears in terms of how many that you need, and it has to do with the you know the you know the 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 rank the sorry the the k where k is the number like the the k is two for a graph and k is three for a, a hyper edge which has three uh, three edges and things like that, um, and so but it turns out that even if when you're working with uh, uh, k equals two like a graph. I believe the bell number in that situation is five. You don't actually need to consider all of these linear equivariant maps. You can only consider two of them, which is a, um, a so some subset of them. Um, and then once you've done this kind of broadcasting, and here you see what what's happened is we're uh, for one entry here, uh, you're going to um, you're going to concatenate the vectors. So so for this kind of two one entry, you're going to have uh, the the input for the first feature and then the input for the second feature concatenated. Um, and then, uh, and then this concatenated feature will then go into another function psi, um, and that psi uh, works on an element-wise basis. Okay, so um, so basically, uh, each of these concatenated vectors will go through some nonlinearity and then produce a, a new output. Uh, and if you want, you can read it off as kind of the diagonal being the sort of uh, the the information on the vertices. Oops, sorry. And then the off-diagonal elements as the edges, um, and uh, and so. So this was a, a simple like kind of set to graph architecture. And what was uh, interesting, and this was really the work of uh, uh, Ron and uh, the guy, is to, to prove that this set to graph type of uh, network has uh, is universal in the same kind of sense that you see with uh, uh, with uh, like deep sets and that that type of theoretical analysis. So um, so anyway, so that's pretty you know kind of interesting. This work was actually motivated by a physics problem. We had a workshop at uh, at the Weizmann Institute, um, and uh, and so we were talking about a, a, a different type of uh, a physics problem that also involves jets. But there, you're basically trying to uh, partition the set of particles into some groups, uh, and that the, the partitioning is related to essentially if they came from a, a common parent or not. Um, and uh, and so you can think of that as a set of particles as the input, and the output as a an adjacency matrix that needs to have this particular kind of block diagonal form, so it looks like a partitioning. Um, and uh, yeah, anyways, we use these models and, uh, you know, not surprisingly, uh, they work pretty well um, and compared to some other other types of benchmarks that were out there. So I just wanted to mention this quickly uh, just because it's some other kind of graph neural network work that's uh, connected to jets and uh, but it's a it's a quite separate from the other line of research that I, I presented. And with that, I think uh, either questions or coffee break and we can come back in a little bit and I'll I'll finish it. Uh, Kyle, I have a question myself. So I just wanted to know, do you need it, do you need it to carry out the computation online uh, in real time with respect to the generation of beams or it is not? Because what I assume is that what you are doing uh, can be used in different ways. One is for is like a trigger to scale down the complexity of the events that you want to to investigate further. On, uh, on the one hand, and at the same time, you would like to reconstruct uh, what uh, went on in the uh, latent space, so in the latent area of your of your phenomena, so that they, you can understand what is going on there. So, but do I know that, for instance, at Large Hadron Colliders, you have a really a huge number of events. So, uh, do you cut down? right away what is not interested to you and you use these uh, techniques to do that in real time or you do that only a, a offline because what you are interested in to discover those events that are allows you to win a nobel prize for instance all right yeah no you, you have a very good understanding so both uh, uh there there are a huge number of different use cases for for these kinds of uh, techniques um, and uh, and so you're absolutely right. There are, uh, and we even refer to them as online, which is the data acquisition process, uh, where we're we're quickly looking at the the data as it's coming in, and we have to decide whether or not it's it's interesting to keep or not because we can't keep all of the data that's being produced. Uh, 
or sometimes we want to keep a subset of it. Um, and uh, and so um, so those algorithms have to run very fast. Um, so that it's done in kind of a, a it's, as a filter. There's sort of a a first filter that's fairly uh, coarse, and then it gets you know it gets you know finer as it goes along. Uh, but the the first version is actually uh, implemented in, in in kind of in hardware hardware or firmware like uh, FPGAs and things like that. And so there is an effort that's going on uh, to uh, to take these graph neural networks that have been trained and then uh, sort of deploy them on FPGA hardware and integrate them into the the what's called the trigger, this filter, this data acquisition system that has to run incredibly fast. Um, and so there, there are a lot of a lot of constraints. Uh, uh, but that is an active line of research um, and it's starting to happen. Um, e still in the data acquisition system, but not necessarily running on uh, on specialized hardware uh, where you have a little bit more time, uh, the uh, but not very long, there's been efforts to try to uh, uh, kind of like stream the data out to some other service where the graph neural networks are you know running on like GPUs or TPUs or something and then send back the answer. Uh, to, and so you have to put it in a buffer basically for a little bit. Um, just to give you a feel, the, the collisions are happening 40 million times a second. Um, and so, and we're only going to keep, you know, a, a very small fraction of that. So the, uh, so you, you have to be, you have to be very quick and this buffer can't get <laughs> too large and there's a lot of data. So, so those are very challenging, uh, but graph neural networks are being used there um, and, or, or there's effort, you know, ongoing to try to build the technical infrastructure so that we can actually use graph neural networks there. Um, and then the the other setting is once you've collected the data and you're analyzing it, which might be a year later or something like that, where you have much more time, um, and then you're, uh, uh, and that's the so-called offline setting, and that's where we do the more careful statistical analysis, where we're kind of after the sort of Nobel Prize winning, you know, discoveries, hopefully, wow. um, yeah. And even there, there's kind of two different settings. Uh, because some of these algorithms that I'm talking about, you would you would never be able to run for the bulk processing of all the data because they're too slow. Uh, but if you can identify things that are very interesting, you might run a very expensive algorithm that might take you know minutes or or you know you know even longer to to analyze a single collision. Yeah, and so there so there are basically all of those happen. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, I have a, a another question. It is more a curiosity. So in uh, doing this. Uh, uh, filtering out in the filtering out your events. So you uh, might that happen that you are uh, discarding and consider as uh, outliers new events that might be fundamental in the history of physics. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the the way that these filters are designed is uh, um, you know that there's a most of the collision involved phenomena that we're, we've already studied essentially and so it's not really the are the target and so that we're kind of happy to throw away that data and what, so we're looking for unusual new uh, types of uh, collisions but most of that is set up essentially as a classification problem where we we train these filters uh, or design these filters so that they're efficient at capturing new types of phenomena that we've thought about <laughs> you know and of course we we don't. We try to make them fairly generic, uh, but uh, but yeah, there is a there is a, a worry that that we when we design those filters, you know, that, that we had the wrong things in mind, and that we're that there are really interesting uh, phenomena that are happening, and we're not uh, selecting those uh, collisions. So we do some things like we'll take an unbiased uh, subset of the data. Mm -hmm. um, so that would see everything. The problem is that the phenomena that we're looking for are very rare. So the chance right, that you're going to see it in the zero, basically. Uh, and so there's increasingly interest in things like anomaly detection. Yeah. Um, and but anomaly detection in the setting is very challenging because uh, we're often th talking about mm. deviations from the the bulk distribution that are at the level of like ten to the minus ten, or something like that. So they're not, uh, and they're often out on tails and uh, so it's not uh, it's a it's a very challenging uh, area for anomaly detection but uh, but ideally but there's a lot of interest in anomaly detection right now so or out of distribution detection or the different ways you can frame it and uh, uh, so that is definitely something that people are interested in and uh, fantastic uh, I have uh, I know uh, there is another question coming to my mind and uh, um, Given the fact that uh, your data are coming from some sensors, so because I look at uh, what you have around as a very 
complex uh, sensor setup, uh, do you suffer, or in a different way, do your algorithms uh, suffer from some non-stationarity in the process, which is associated with the aging in the interaction of uh, those uh, high energy elements, items with uh, the sensor? Yeah, yeah, you should be a physicist. It's a, good, it's a very good question. Uh, the, uh, um, so there are a few, there's one sense in which the, we try to make everything as stationary as possible. And, and uh, when we try, you know, we work very hard to keep a very stable running environment at the, at the collider to tr avoid those issues. Mm -hmm. And we throw away a lot of data if we recognize that something is, uh, you know, that. Uh, however, um, there, there are two forms of non-stationarity that we can't do anything about. Uh, one is that the sensors are being, you know, irradiated by like very, very intense radiation all the time yeah. and sitting down there for years, you know. So so with time, they're just degrading. And uh, th so that's the, that's, that's the main reason that the Large Hadron Collider, you know, is we have will run for a year or two and then we'll stop and there will be some upgrades and there's going to be a major upgrade uh, nice. coming in, in a few years is to try to deal with that radiation damage but that's very slow process you know very right. very slow process i see um the thing and then there's another form of stationarity non-stationarity that's much faster which is that when we fill up the ring um uh, we, the ring is filled up with with you know protons and they're colliding and with time the number of them starts to to diminish, you know, over the course of hours, um, mm. and and also within the ring, they're kind of grouped together in some way. So uh, so there's parts where, like, uh, yeah, there's you know uh, there's non-stationarity, but we kind of know the conditions at any particular time. Mm -hmm. And so if you condition on th th those you know uh, those running conditions, and you look at all the data that we collect under those same conditions, it's pretty much stationary. Okay, but thank uh, you. But so you're much. right. Yeah, okay. thanks. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Okay, can I, agree. Uh, I have two questions if I if, uh, still have time. So one regarding the data. So from well, my little experience with high energy physics, a lot of research is done, uh, both learning and experiments on simulated data. And as you explained, simulators are uh, extremely accurate. Uh, do you ever work with real data or is it at all interesting? Uh, uh, Basically, what's what's the difference between real data and, and simulated data? And uh, because in other applications, like in biology, the, 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 the gap is huge. And second question, well, this is probably more speculative. Do you believe that uh, we'll see some physics beyond the standard model, something that is not expected or not predicted? Well, I'm not talking about necessarily new particles, but maybe well, new I don't know, combinations of quarks, for example, or something like this. Yeah. Well, they're both they're both very good questions. Yeah. So I. Um, in practice, like so, for the first question about simulated data, um, in, in practice, the most of what we do is some hybrid of using the simulated data to kind of guide what's going on and to prototype things. But then we recognize that the simulation is not perfect, and so then we'll use real data to, uh, you know, validate it or calibrate it or something like that. So that happens a lot. Um, but um, um, but what, and I should also say that the simulation. Is is quite accurate for, uh, I mean, well, it's very very accurate for a lot of objects. But these jets are the hardest thing to simulate. Um, so, um, so in some sense, jets are um, are a place where your, your trust of the simulator is uh, not a, not as high. So that's partially why, like, some of the thread of this research is, can we can we get to the point where we have a generative model that's informed by a lot of our physics, but we fit it to the data. Um, and so that we have a, a higher fidelity simulation of what's going on uh, that's you know somewhat data driven. Um, and and then and ideally, if we parameterize that uh, that simulator in terms of like you know physically meaningful things, then that like that fitting of the simulator is doing physics, right? You know that's like we're learning physics in the process. So right now, uh, the the fact that these jets are so complicated and we don't really have techniques to study them as well as we'd like is a bottleneck. So, so trying to probe what's going on inside of the jets has not been something we've really been able to do, uh, but th this research is getting to the point where we're kind of on we're on the verge of that. We're we're on the verge of being able to study what's going on inside the jet, uh, which is essentially you know that's what our simulators have. But that theory is we've known to be deficient, and so we would like to be able to improve that. Um, uh, when you get into things like anomaly detection, people are interested in trying to train that in essentially a data-driven way as much as possible. 
Um, and in this example that I showed here at the end, uh, this type of generative model, what's interesting is that, you know, the, the art, you, you can take observed data, um, you can run the clustering on it, you can get this type of, uh, you know, uh, you know, tree-like structure that has a this uh, tractable likelihood that's written out in a kind of autoregressive way. And then you can fit the parameters of this model uh, to observed data. Um, and that's basically what's happening here. I mean, when they actually ran this, it was simulated data, but you could have run it on obs observed data. It would have been exactly the same. Um, and then, but in this case, you're able to compare what was what it learned to the ground truth from the simulation, and you see that they actually agreed quite well. So, so what's exciting about this is you can run it on real data, and it's a it's like a generative model, uh, and it and that generative model is not kind of a black box. It has causal structure in it. So it's, I call it a, a kind of a, a causal generative model, but it's implemented in this hybrid between a neural network and some kind of domain specific algorithms. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so this is kind of pointing to a, tap, a path forward where we, we start to replace our traditional simulators with something that's a little bit more data driven. Um, oh, and then the next question was the, 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 the harder one. Do I think that there will be some new physics? So, um, so one is in terms of like, other types of particles that are like rearrangements of the things that we already know about um, that that is happening like the LHCB experiment has discovered uh, quite a few new uh, particles called hadrons that um, but they're not they're not fundamental particles but they're still important uh, like we hadn't seen them before and now we're seeing them and it's and they're useful for trying to understand the theory of the strong force and so that's interesting um, and then there's also even if we don't produce something new like the LHC might not have enough energy to produce like some new uh, particle uh, that might exist uh, in nature. Um, but what's interesting is that if it's there, it can influence through very subtle effects uh, what we see in the data. And so actually just uh, this week, there was an announcement from the LHCB experiment that they are seeing a, uh, a deviation between you know how often certain kinds of particles decay into electrons and muons. And the, and the prediction is that should be exactly the same. And the standard model, that should be exactly the same. And they they now see sort of three sigma you know three sigma evidence three and a half sigma evidence uh, that they're not the same, and in most fields that would be a discovery. In particle physics, uh, we have a kind of stri more stringent demands before we claim a discovery, uh, but uh, but that would be the first like really 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 exciting sign of uh, of physics beyond the standard model. So um, so let's hope so. Uh, whether or not we do, it's hard to guess. I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> OK, so um, should we take a little five minute break and then if or, I mean, I can either stop there. I did have a, a sort of part two, which which is shorter. Um, uh, as, or, as you as you wish, uh, Kyle. OK, um, let's see, it's. We what to, I have the last what time it is, it's. So we have what was the time left that was uh, I've gotten confused about time zones. Uh, I mean, it is basically up to you. I think uh, we we can stop it here. If you have uh, some more 15 minutes, uh, maybe something that uh, you want to, to present to us. Uh, 15 sure. minutes, you say, yeah, 20 minutes, something like that. OK, well, if it's OK, then yeah, maybe I'll show you something for 15 minutes on a totally different. It's, I think it's pretty fun. Uh, so uh -huh. uh, OK, so uh, absolutely. So let's go for that. I mean, uh, then then I'll go ahead and start now. Yeah. Sure. OK, OK, so um, OK, great. So same same sort of slides to motivate uh, lots uh, of great collaborators. Record. Yes. Uh, please record the, the, the class. In the uh, teams, I mean, because it's not recording right now. Um, yes, uh, it's, Daniele, it's, it's, Daniele. No, it's recording. I see it recording. Ah, it's recording. Ah, sorry. Okay. My mistake. Yeah, it says it's recording for me. Um, OK, so I'll get going again. Um, so. Same collaborators, same basic theme about uh, inside of the data generating process and inductive bias. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of skip through this. Uh, um, the same uh, point that I want to make about this kind of uh, algorithmic alignment. Um, uh, but what I want to talk about is sort of extensions of this work that uh, Peter Battaglia and, and, and Daniel Rosende and company did on uh, sort of modeling physical systems as graphs. And so here, the physical systems are like dynamical systems. So in this example, you have some, some you know, particles that are moving around with like uh, gravitational forces between them. In this example, it's like, uh, you know, they're just moving around, but there's rigid things and they're bouncing off of each other. This one, it's like a chain that's falling. Uh, 
Um, and, uh, and so they use graph neural networks to try to uh, uh, model these systems. Um, and the way that they uh, kind of, uh, you know, formulated the kind of landscape of different graphs. This is, uh, you know, slides from from Peter, where you see things like some message passing neural networks, deep sets, et cetera, et cetera. And this paper is, you know, now several years old, so, you know, the, the people might formulate it in a different way now, but this graph network uh, formulation that they had is, is pretty general in the sense that you have uh, information on edges, you have information on nodes, and you also have some kind of global state for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the entire graph, and 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 essentially everything can talk to everything, and uh, and this is a, a layer where you basically start off with information on the uh, nodes, uh, uh, sorry, the edges, the the vertices, and the sorry, the global state, the vertices and the edges, and then you get new new versions of of all of those. So I'm not going to bother with this. So uh, if you're working with an in-body system, you know uh, where where they're kind of uh, interacting, say like gravitationally or or with a spring or something. You know the type of graph that you would want to put is fairly, uh, you know, it's almost like cheating. You know the inductive bias is sort of so obvious what you would like to do. Uh, you're just going to, you know, the edges correspond to basically forces and things, so it's very natural uh, to to build a graph like that. Uh, you could put a different graph and then and then uh, that has the wrong structure and see what happens. But in this case, the structure is sort of nicely aligned to the actual physics. Um, okay, so I, I'm just sort of flipping through these uh, slides. And so the way that this is trained is that they would take a dynamical system and they use a physical simulator to evolve the system as a function of time. Um, and then they would use uh, training data, which are basically snapshots at different moments in time where you know the location and the momenta uh, of, uh, or the velocity of, of all of the, you know, the particles. Um, and, and that's what the training data. Okay, and so here is uh, uh, examples of uh, a thousand time step rollout, and on the top you see the the ground truth from the simulator, and on the bottom you see uh, the model after it's been trained, trying to predict the dynamics of the system, and so it looks quite good. It's not you know perfect. If you look at it, uh, some of these systems are chaotic, so like small perturbations might lead to large differences. But uh, kind of for a, a small time period, the the physics that you see from the model looks very plausible. Um, and uh, and that's kind of maybe the more important thing than the, the chaotic dynamics, right? Um, and what's interesting is once you train these systems, you can, uh, with without retraining them, you can apply them to a system of a different size. And so there's this kind of zero shot generalization ability. Um, uh, and so you see uh, here running these graph neural networks on new systems. So this is in some sense like an extrapolation to a different uh, system size or something like that. And so uh, so this is, you know, it's pretty impressive, right? OK, and there's been some more recent work with much larger systems where you see things like this, which are pretty, uh, you know, they're really fun to look at uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it's being rendered, but the system is being modeled as a, basically a bunch of little particles uh, and they're they're all interacting with each other using very much the same kind of uh, approach. Now, um, so what, what we did was basically add two different forms of inductive bias to this uh, this type of setup. And so this was work that I did uh, together with uh, Peter and then also uh, Alvaro and Victor. Um, and so I'm just going to talk about those in forms of inductive bias real quick. So um, so you can think about the system as sort of evolving in time from one time step to another time step where physics is, is the evolution. Um, and so the time step n and n plus one, and you have the, you know, the state of the system is modeled by essentially like positions and momenta of all the particles in the system. Um, um, and so that's that's the here's the system evolving according to the physics. Um, and what they did, uh, I'm going to call you know previously what I just showed you, I'm going to call it the delta graph network. And so what the graph network is doing is basically saying, okay, I get to train on a bunch of, you know, time step and the next time step pairs. And so I'm going to try to learn what the update rule is. Uh, so the delta uh, between the position and the momenta. So that's the delta graph network. Um, and so what? And I was looking at this and thinking of it from the physics point of view. I was thinking, well, you know, this is like a dynamical system. It would be really cool if you could just like learn the dynamics like uh, more natively. And I guess, and, and, you know, maybe, maybe more importantly, is in terms of like continuous time dynamics. Um, and so, so that led to this kind of uh, 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 graph neural network where instead of learning a delta uh, update rule, trying to embed uh, an integrator uh, like a you know like a Runge-Kutta integrator into the network. And and uh, and the integrator will take the current state of the system 
and then some dynamical equations that's, that basically say uh, how to evolve, you know, evolve the system into the future. Um, and, it, and so that's the kind of uh, what's called the OGN part here. And so then, so the idea is that if you knew this dynamical system, it's basically going to uh, uh, predict, you know, given the, the current position of momenta, it's going to uh, predict the rate of change of the position of momenta. That's the little dot notation. Um, and so the OGN, basically, you know, the graph neural network is going to try to learn basically what that update rule should be. Um, and it's done like a, as a function over the vertices. OK, so that's one way of doing it. But if, you, if you're a physicist, you also know that you know, this is not just any dynamical system. It's a Hamiltonian system. And so really, there's a, a, this Hamilton's equation. And there's a Hamiltonian that describes the energy of any configuration. And that's really what I need to know to evolve the system. And so there, there, there's a special form. The, 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 the dynamical equations take on a special form, which is that they should look like partial derivatives uh, of, of either the position or the momenta of the system. And what's interesting is that there are partial derivatives of a scalar function, uh, and that's global. So, so there's this incredible bottleneck that you can put on the system, which is to learn like a single scalar quantity for the entire graph. Um, once you know that, then you can use automatic differentiation to like differentiate that thing with respect to position and momenta, so that the features on the nodes of the graph, and that will predict you know the the time evolution, and then the integrator will use that and and, and evolve the system forward. Um, and so this is similar to what was going on with, for instance, neural uh, uh, neural ODEs, where you try to promote a kind of uh, something like a ResNet, uh, which which uh, uh, which has layers. You can think of those layers as like discrete points in time, and so like discrete time evolution. And instead, you can promote it to a continuous time evolution, um, uh, which in principle you could solve exactly with a, a differential equation. But in, numerically, you're going to use a, a, an integrator. And so then the points where the integrator evaluates the function are like can be spread out in some you know non-uniform way. And, and, and those uh, points where it's evaluating the function are sort of like the analog of layers of a neural network. Um, and so the same kinds of ideas, for instance, were used in Fjord, which is like a normalizing flow, which instead of having several uh, uh, a concatenation or, of, uh, or a composition of several uh, invertible functions or bijections to, to learn a complicated distribution, instead it takes it learns the dynamics for how to flow uh, in continuous time a simple distribution to a complicated distribution. So it's similar in spirit to that. Um, so with these two different, uh, uh, you know, inductive biases, on the left I'm going to show the ground truth rollout for some system. We'll pick this blue dot, uh, with just one of the one of the particles in the system, and, and follow it. And so over here we'll see the the trajectory following the true Hamiltonian of the system. That you know, um, here using the delta uh, the delta graph network. Here, this uh, ODE graph network, and here the Hamiltonian graph network, and you'll see uh, basically, you know, you know how good is the model at predicting uh, what's going on from the, the true Hamiltonian. And so, when I run it forward, it's looking pretty good. You're going to start to see the delta graph network diverging from the uh, uh, from the ground truth, while the OGN approach is is doing better for longer. But the Hamiltonian based approach. Like even you know for after a very long rollout is still basically indistinguishable with the uh, the true Hamiltonian, so um, so that's you know I think pretty cool. Um, and uh, but then I'm going to end with kind of a parable here, which is that uh, when you look at the different uh, metrics that we considered, you know to see like how you know to compare these different approaches, you want to like uh, quantify how good are these different approaches. Uh, you know intuitively you just want to look to see like how well do they match the true Hamiltonian, right? Um, and so here's a plot uh, where you see so it's the error in terms of like say the energy of the system. There's also one in terms of position, um, and you see you know different numbers. And so in, in green here is the best one. It's the the ODE graph network, um, and in gray is the true Hamiltonian. And so this, this is a, a kind of confusing result. What you're seeing is that the this graph neural network is actually doing better than the true Hamiltonian. Uh, and so you're like, wait, how can that possibly be? And also, like, why does the true Hamiltonian not have an error of zero, right? So th the thing is that when we made this plot, what we're doing is that the, the, the we're comparing two things. We're comparing the the rollout, the ground truth rollout, which uses the true Hamiltonian, but also a very high quality integrator with very tiny time steps. So you can think of it as a very accurate forward evolution in time, uh, 
Um, but then the thing that we compare it to are the models ro uh, running with what, what might be a much coarser time step. OK, so the, the model uses a, a larger time step. And so if you use the true Hamiltonian, but with a large time step, then uh, then the, it, you, you start to accumulate errors in the in the kind of uh, in the in the numerical integration of this the true Hamiltonian, and so that's why there's some uh, some error here. Okay, so it's not that the physics is wrong; it's that the integrator is not doing a good job. Um, and what's interesting is that the the OGN approach here actually does better than the true Hamiltonian, and so you might think, oh, that's great, right? And uh, in some sense, it's good, uh, but. Um, but really what it's what it's doing is somehow learning how to correct for the residuals in the in the integration. And so you might think that's cool, but the thing that you you know from a physicist's point of view that whatever that graph network is learning is not really the underlying physics. It's learning the underlying physics mixed up in some co complicated way with the residuals of some numerical integration algorithm and that, which I don't really care about, right? Um so so, so while it might work here, it's not going to generalize well to other situations because uh, it doesn't have it hasn't captured the essential physics. And so, so you know, so here I think the part of the parable of this story is that this metric is really not what I care about, right? Um, so, so kind of simple simple metrics like numerical metrics about like prediction error are not capturing this thing that I care about in terms of uh, you know generalization to other kinds of systems and things like that. Um, and here are just some other examples of the plots like that. Here you see if we trained the, the networks where the model rollout had a, a delta time step of like 0.1, you know, in arbitrary units, 0.1 seconds or something, uh, then um, uh, then the graph, the delta graph network performs quite well if the at test time we use a different, if we, sorry, if we use the same time step at test time, it works quite well. But if we use a different time step at test time, it doesn't perform well. The error is quite large. Um, and and uh, and so, but you see that, for instance, the other approaches that learn a kind of continuous time dynamics, the OGN and the HOGN, uh, they perform quite well and they generalize across different time steps because they learn like the, the intrinsic physics better. Um, and here's another one where we switch out what kind of integrator we use. So these are Runjakutta, different orders of Runjakutta, one, two, three, four. Um, and, and what you see here is that again, um, in, in green and blue, uh, you know, are the, the the delta graph network is actually doing better than the uh, you know than the uh, um, than the uh, uh, what am I trying to say than the, the than even the true Hamiltonian. Uh, but again, this is some kind of weird uh, weird uh, you know learning of residuals, and so this isn't going to uh, to to generalize well. And you see that the Hamiltonian approach has the same qualitative features as the true Hamiltonian does. So there's like growing evidence that the, the Hamiltonian network has like learned the underlying physics. Um, and so part of the reason I, I bring this up again, is, sorry, is that this, oops, um, is that this uh, this idea of, ha you know, forcing the uh, the network to have a bottleneck in it um, uh, is, is has this kind of al alignment idea again to the physics. Um, so here we forced it to go through a scalar bottleneck um, and that helped align with the, the physics of what's going on. And you, here you see in uh, Pitar's talk, uh, this algorithmic alignment, he's talking about trying to learn modules that are sort of like the components of an algorithm and also a sort of scalar alignment and these same kinds of ideas. Um, and then we did some follow-up work where after training one of these networks, um, <clears throat> so we would do the same thing. We would try to learn a dynamical system. Here are a bunch of different dynamical systems um, that we learned. Um, and and what we did is we put a bottleneck on the edges uh, so that the um, and, and we also sort of enforce that with an L1 sparsity regularization. And so that would try to make sparse messages on the edges. And when we did that, what we saw was that the information on the edges, uh, the messages that are being sent, started to develop a linear relationship with the actual ground truth forces. So the messages actually start to have like, you know, physically meaning semantics. You don't you don't enforce it to learn the the forces it just kind of learns the forces on its own um, and then uh, and then we once we learned those forces uh, we ran symbolic regression uh, on the messages themselves um, and we learned some you know some simple functions and if you look at this uh, function it's just a rotated version you know it's just a you know a rotated uh, version of the force law that you have uh, for the ground truth so this kind of pairing of graph neural networks 
uh, and having them align to the the true underlying mechanism, um, uh, and then putting bottlenecks and uh, and trying to enforce this alignment allowed us to basically, together with symbolic uh, 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 regression, to actually extract the underlying physics. Um, and this these kinds of things you see, uh, you know, also in St uh, Stephanie's talk that this hypothesis is that. You know, well, one is even talking about you know linear functions, uh, this alignment, and if you have some sort of linear function, it might help with extrapolation to like uh, different kinds of systems and things like that. And uh, and so, anyways, we're just seeing a lot of evidence for some of these uh, uh, observations and some of these theoretical results uh, in these systems. Uh, there was another example where we did it trying to predict graph, uh, sorry, uh, over densities of dark matter and, and very large graphs. And uh, you know, we we ended up deriving some equation. Uh, again, from you know, using symbolic regression on the uh, on the messages that were being passed on the uh, on the uh, on the on the graph. And what was interesting is that this uh, uh, is that this uh, equation, uh, which was extracted from the graph neural network, actually has better generalization properties than the graph neural network itself, which is kind of funny. So here again, you see some notion of equations as a, a form of inductive bias. So, um, anyways, I think all this stuff is uh, is pretty interesting. Um, and uh, and I will basically, you know, end end with that. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that was enjoyable. And uh, um, and uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> no, absolutely, yes, it was a really great talk. I mean, uh, I'm enjoying enjoy that so much, and I'm sure that all these students uh, uh, had the same experience, great experience. So uh, I don't know if there are some questions. Uh, uh, if someone wishes to ask something to Professor Cranmer. Don't be shy. Uh, I have a question. I'm not sure if uh, it's well posed. Then uh, I, I excuse myself for, uh, for, for it. But um, OK, we talk about alignment, right? In order to, for example, um, uh, learn some, some feature that is not so clear uh, how to model. For example, as you say, I mean, using the, this, this kind of bottleneck in order to, to learn some, some specific physical uh, rules, for example. And then I was wondering, is it possible that using um, the same kind of approach is possible also to model some, let's say, emerging properties that we don't know exactly how to, to model mathematically because they, they come from the interaction? And then uh, let's say, starting from, from something simple, try to make a, a bias or a bottleneck and then see if the mod, uh, if the network or our uh, units are able in some way to model it and then uh, it emerged from the from their, um, uh, how do you say, uh, no connection, uh, interaction. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great question and it's definitely something that I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, so the um, I guess, what do I, I want to say? So first is that, um, is that I think that, you know, in, in the setting like what I'm talking about right now, I mean, that is where you would like to go. That absolutely is like the right direction, I, I think. Um, you know, when you have, if you understand the microscopic system uh, and it has all sorts of interactions, it, it may be more complicated or it may be that you have simple mechanisms between individual components, but there's so many of them that it's just very difficult to deal with. Um, and then so if some emergent phenomena, uh, you know, emerges, then um, what you would hope is there would be a different description with different degrees of freedom, and maybe there would be a new mechanism that would emerge along with it. And so at that, from in that language, the way I usually think of it is that I want the coarse graining of the, the graph. I want to go from a graph over the, the fine grained, you know, components uh, and then move to a new graph that has fewer components and those components correspond to the whatever the entities in your emergent phenomena are and then you would try to learn what the interactions between those new emergent you know objects are um, and so that is something i'm i'm very interested in it involves sort of trying to learn how to do coarse grainings of graphs dynamically um, and then what if you could learn how to do the coarse graining then a lot of the same well, you know, here there was sort of cheating, right? We had kind of already put the, the right structure on the graph, right? Like the, uh, um, and then we tried to uh, uh, see if we could extract the, the, the mechanism. So what you would like to do is sort of simultaneously learn how to coarse grain and how to put the right graph structure on and then how to learn the right kinds of messages on them. Uh, but you can you can imagine, you know, how that would 
in the future how that might play out. And, but that's exactly to me one of the most compelling uh, questions and how like deep learning and, and, and science uh, fit together is exactly that. So thanks for the question. <laughs> no, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. I have a question. Maybe it's more philosophical question. So I, uh, I really like the work with uh, symbolic regression. Do you think that this at least uh, potentially a direction to reconcile between the symbolist and connectionist in artificial intelligence, let's say the placeholders, uh, Benjo and, and, and Marcos, uh, or is it still yeah. a far cry from that? Hmm. Yeah, you know, exactly. I think, you know, I, I mean, a lot of the things I talked about, I think, touch on that. So one is this symbolic regression picture, which is definitely bringing in the, you know, the, well, the kind of, you know, there's the, the you know, and the connectionist symbolic kind of thing. It's obviously on the symbolic side. Um, also, I think this work about sticking in the numerical integrator is kind of interesting. There you have a like, non-learnable component that's doing something for you. And you can think of it kind of symbolically as like, you know, you know, evolve this in time according to some known rules. Uh, and and uh, what's interesting there is that if you want to do learning in this, and you know, based on what I was uh, showing here, um, you need to be able to uh, back propagate through the integrator. Um, and so technically, you know, there's a little bit of work to do that. Uh, but um, but you know, we we did it. Well, that was mainly Alvaro's work. But the uh, um, but that ties into this like growing body of work around implicit layers. Where you don't think of layers necessarily as just like a, a, a you know, a ReLU or a, you know, some kind of simple neural network component, but you might have something more complicated, and uh, uh, and so one of the examples of something more complicated that you might stick in there is a uh, is a dynamic programming algorithm, and so in this workshop that I was mentioning, um, you know, I think that was one of the most fascinating workshops. I think when you start thinking about, uh, you know, several years ago there was like. A, uh, neural computation and like, can we make neural Turing machines and these kinds of things? Um, you can go in that direction. I think in some sense, this work about al algorithmic reasoning and stuff about implicit layers and having maybe some dynamic programming algorithms that you can differentiate through. To me, that looks like the more near term, interesting direction. Um, and then you really start to see this hybrids between symbolic things and, you know, kind of classical engineering things and deep learning. And, yep. uh, and to me, that's a, that that feels right to me. I guess I, I, I don't I don't think that this this purely uh, black box deep learning thing with no inductive bias has a there's sort of just a a uh, no free lunch sort of uh, you know message there. Uh. Okay. Right. <laughs> Great. Uh, other questions? No. Uh, so I think that uh, it is time to to conclude this great uh, uh, lecture. Uh, thank you, Kyle. And uh, we are really looking forward to welcoming you in Lugano next time I, it happens to be around. And uh, uh, you mentioned Como Lake. I'm from there. So if you All come right. to Como Lake, just drop us an email and uh, we will meet. We go out and uh, we enjoy the Swiss and Italian life of uh, living. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. I would, I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So thanks, thanks again. So yes, bye thank bye, you. Kyle. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, students, uh, I hope that you enjoyed. I'm sure you, you did. And uh, so uh, let's say hello to Professor Professor Kramer. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah.